Hey listeners, welcome to the 41st episode of The Goods Film Podcast. How you doing today, Brian? Pretty good. That's right, it's 41, the George W. Bush of episodes. <laughs> George H. W. Wait, Bush. Yeah, right? I was going to say, that was H. Dub. He was 43. And Trump is 45, and Biden is 46, right? Right. I wonder who the 50th president will be. It could be you, Brian. It could be. Well be that old by then. You're almost there. You only got to be 35. Yeah, I will be for the next election, I think. Yeah. Let me think about that. Yeah, I will be. Yeah. Start putting that out there. My uh, next door neighbor growing up told me that he was going to run for president one day. And I told him I would vote for him. And every birthday of his, I text him and I say, still planning on voting for you for president someday. You can do it. But yeah. I mean, now that he actually could run for president, as to your point, we are reaching that age. We've gone a little field here from the original topic, which is for our 41st episode, the 2015 film that is an adaptation of a, I think it's 2008 John Green novel, Paper Towns. Brian, had you seen Paper Towns prior to this week? So I had not seen or read any of the John Green works up to this point, but my younger brother, Andrew, who has been a guest on the podcast, is a big fan. There was a stage of his life, I think when he was in high school, where he went down, I think it was the list of coming of age stories on Wikipedia and tried to read or watch most of them. And as part of that journey, he worked his way through the John Green bibliography. And he's got like a box set of at least the first four Abundance of Catherines and Fault in Our Stars and this one. And I feel like there's at least one other one. Uh, Looking for Alaska is his second most famous behind Fault in Our Stars. He He's written five solo novels. Those are Looking for Alaska, An Abundance of Catherines, Paper Towns, The Fault in Our Stars, and Turtles All the Way Down. And then he released his first book of nonfiction, The Anthropocene Reviewed, just this year. Uh, it's based off of his podcast, which, as I have mentioned in the past, is probably my favorite podcast of all time. So I, I did, in fact, read that. He has co-written a few books where he's half or a third of the authorship. Let It Snow is a Christmas anthology of romances, coming-of-age romances, which I really enjoy. He also wrote a book called Will Grayson, Will Grayson, where he was one of the writers. The other was David Levithan, who was another big coming-of-age writer in the mid-2000s, late 2000s. And the premise of that one was there were two boys named Will Grayson whose fates interconnected, and that was a pretty interesting read because they have very different writing styles and it would alternate chapters with writers and, and Will Grayson's. Um, and he's he's written a handful of other things too, but that got a little bit uh, Wikipedia encyclo- encyclopedic there. But the reason I do that is because I have a lot of feelings about John Green and they're almost entirely positive. He might be my favorite writer. I don't think there's any other writer where if they released literally any piece of writing, I would probably go and purchase it. Like, I don't think there's anyone else who's in that boat for me. And his novels have been really meaningful to me, a little bit less so as I've gotten older. But when I was in my young 20s, I think that's when I first encountered them and still feeling like I was growing up, his novels were extremely meaningful to me. And I've I've kept up with him since. And I think he is what I would want to be if I became famous. He does not cash in on his celebrity very much, and he's extremely thoughtful and positive and wants to make sure everything he does, in his own words, decreases world suck. 
and I've just I've, I've been a big admirer of him. Um, he's very funny, but also very articulate in everything he does, whether it's his podcasts or his he, he does the YouTube series Vlog Brothers, where he and his brother Hank uh, once a week make YouTube videos to each other. And I, I watch most of those when they come out. Um, it's probably the YouTube series I've kept up with most. Yeah, so they were huge YouTubers back in the early days, like even prior to the books getting big. And so they've been on the scene for a long time. Right, yeah. Yeah, that was actually part of his kind of breakout was that he had a cult audience and basically pitched his book. And... um that was a good word of mouth for his first book. Two of his books, um, Looking for Alaska and An Abundance of Catherines, have won or have been selected as Prince Honor books. Now, I think Looking for Alaska might have actually won the award and not just been an honor, but I'm not sure. But the Prince Award is the equivalent of the Newberry or the Caldecott, but for young adult novels. Um, it, it's not as well known as those ones and it doesn't have as long a history, but I try to read many, as many of the Prince honor books and winners as I can. And well, I remember at one point, John Green was working for mental floss, the sort of, uh, intellectual fun magazine aimed at smart people or people who want to think that they're smart. And I found that series pretty entertaining. In one previous episode, I brought up my friend Zach, who I knew in elementary school and middle school and high school. And previously, I compared Maxwell Brock, the cool beatnik character in A Bucket of Blood, to my friend Zach. But uh, even more so, John Green reminds me of that guy. Just a smart, funny presence who just seems like a nice guy. Like... Exactly the way that you said. I feel like of famous people, John Green is perhaps the one it would be easiest to befriend. Yeah, he, he's at the top of my list of the thought exercise. If you could have lunch with every, any living person, who would it be? And it used to be a two-person race on that between John Green and the songwriter Adam Schlesin Schlesinger, who unfortunately passed away with covid so now John Green has that title. But no, I, I'm completely with you. Um, he also, he wrote book reviews for Booklist. And he's got a really good essay in, about his experience writing for Booklist and the mental health he struggled with when he was there in either his podcast or the book he just released, The Anthropocene Reviewed. He, he's been quite prolific, although he's scaled back as he has matured, and now he, he only does a handful of things, but they all tend to be worth your time. Not only is he just generally likable and his, his books are good, he is a phenomenal prose writer. He makes me want to be a better prose writer. He just manages to write these phrases and sentences and passages that are just so beautiful or funny or resonant. And some of them have like, I'm 14 and this is deep feel to them. But honestly, most of them are just really clever and good. And I just love hearing the language that tumbles out of him. So, yeah, if you've never encountered John Green, I know some he has a little bit of a middling reputation among the public sometimes, in part because he's like a older white guy who writes teen books. And that's just kind of a cringy thing. He was really influential in general on the direction of YA in the mid 2000s. He popularized books where the characters are like really articulate and funny and it's kind of contemporary without much of a high concept to it. In fact, you sometimes call hear that called green lit and that's a trend that persists to this day. So he's he's definitely been influential there and I think some people kind of resent that a little bit, but for me, you're only going to hear positive things about John Green. So, 
That's kind of my prelude. I wanted to to do something John Green related at some point. Two of his books have been adapted to movies. Uh, the Fault in Our Stars in 2014 was a massive hit and brought that book to the public consciousness. It was like the number one best-selling book of 2014, I think, two years after it came out. And then Paper Towns was adapted a year later. And then just either last year or the year before, Looking for Alaska, which had long been in development hell, was adapted as a miniseries for, for Hulu. So we are sampling one of those adaptations today. And the, the reason I picked this one, it's one that I saw when it came out in theaters and I haven't seen since. And I wanted a road trip movie. Brian picked a road trip movie. The surprisingly charming, what was that called? Taurus Trap, starring Daniel Stern. So this was my road trip movie. Although it's interesting, the road trip doesn't come in until the last third of the story. Yeah, I was surprised. I thought it might receive a little bit more of the runtime. But it is a memorable road trip relative to the to the plot. Oh yeah, definitely. So the movie stars Nat Wolf, who I was very excited to see cast as Q. I, I was following the development and the release of this film because I was a big fan of the book. I was excited when he was cast because he was in The Fault in Our Stars, and he is, in my opinion, the best part of The Fault in Our Stars. Just a very funny but also like personable, kind of intense also energy that just felt like he could actually act. I think I brought up in a previous episode that I think it was the um, last day of summer that if I were dream recasting that, I would have had Nat Wolf as the, the star at the time because he was in the Naked Brothers Band show and band in the, the mid-2000s before he has had his kind of solo acting career since. Yeah, so... That may or may not be a good mark on his record. Uh, I mostly know Naked Brothers Band from their song, I Don't Want to Go to School, which is a very bad song. <laughs> they, they basically just sing, I don't want to go to school, over and over again. Which, I mean, I guess that is capturing the voice of the people, but it did not necessarily foreshadow... The career that lay ahead. <laughs> uh, but it is interesting that he had a supporting role in Fault in Our Stars and then came to the lead here. It's kind of like a Martin Sheen in the American President situation. Right. In the wings and then promoted to the lead. So it's a fairly faithful adaptation of the book. I'll talk a little bit about some of the differences between the book and the movie, but I should note up front, I somewhat enthusiastically overprepared for this episode. I watched the movie about two and a half times, one of which I had the audio commentary from the DVD, which is John Green and the director, Jake Shear Schreier, I think it's pronounced. Apologies if that's not the correct pronunciation. And Jake Schreier, you will know from absolutely nothing else. He has not done basically anything else of note to my observation, but uh, they, they did have a pretty good and fun commentary. I also reread the book for context. I, I had a vacation weekend at the beach, so I had a good chance to catch up on some reading. So I am uh, fully prepared for this episode. And for reference, I did not read the book. I watched the movie once, felt like I probably ought to read the book, but <laughs> Dan said he didn't want me to so that we could have those different perspectives. Yeah, this movie is really tough for me to wrap my brain around because it was an adaptation of a story I already knew well, cared a lot about, and was viewing as strictly an adaptation as opposed to a movie that I might otherwise be excited for as a movie in and of itself. It had me thinking about what are the adaptations that are in a similar boat for me, like where... I mostly wanted to see it because I loved the source material. The obvious one for me is the entire Harry Potter series, which I had very similar feelings about in the sense that it was kind of hard for me to separate my experience watching the movie from my experience and knowledge and emotions towards the book. 
What are, are some notable adaptations of your movie viewing career, Brian? So Harry Potter is definitely on there for me, too. And then, I don't know. It's kind of more of a stretch after that. I remember reading Watchmen and being really into that uh, shortly before that movie came out. That's a good one. I was actually in a seminar in college about graphic novels, and we read Watchmen prior to the film coming out. And so that was a really cool experience, having just read it and discussed it in a seminar and then getting to go and see it. Yeah, similar boat. I was in my freshman year of college for that one. You got any others that come to your mind? Um, Ender's Game was another one for me. That book I had read a couple of times and always thought that there was some there was some stuff in it that I wanted to see cinematically because I had a hard time envisioning it. Um, that would be a fun one to pick for this podcast sometime because it's like this one, one that I watched in theaters but haven't seen since and my memory of it is a little bit faded. Interesting. So that's one where I have read the book but I have not seen the movie. Oh, yeah, that would be a good pick for us then. One book I think would make a really good movie. Uh, there was one back in the silent film days, but as far as I know, there hasn't been a more recent adaptation, is the book McTeague, which I wrote a blurb about on our blog at one point. Definitely would be down to discuss that at some point, but I found many scenes in that story super cinematic as i was reading it and could just picture what a movie would be in my head so that's one that if i hear they're making another movie of it i would uh, i would line up for that one yeah there have been some others where i read the book but it wasn't attached enough to the source material to like really anticipate the movie adaptation like the hunger games i was kind of excited to see in part just because I really wasn't interested in going back and reading the the story. And I was like, eh, I'll just see the movie and let the movie be the canonical version. I think a lot of people feel that way about the Harry Potter books. Like they now when they think of Harry Potter, they just think of the, the movies and not the books. Whereas for me, I was a little too wrapped up in the, the books. And then, of course, you can go down the list of like things that were already adapted. And now I have I have both read and watched the movie and kind of have my own relationship with each, like Fight Club. I actually just read Fight Club, the book, and I've, of course, seen the movie, and I know it is a favorite of yours. Have you actually read the book on that one? I did, and I think that's a case where the two are pretty similar, although usually when I tend to say that is when I watch the movie and then read the book afterwards, where it's like, yeah, right. that, that's pretty much the same, whereas if you go the other way and you start with the book, you notice all the things that didn't make it to the movie, and it's like, oh, they left that out. So you mentioned one book that you'd like to see another adaptation of. Are there any others that you haven't seen that you'd really like to see? Like there is a movie and I haven't seen it, or that there has not been a movie and I think there really should be? That there hasn't been a movie and you really think there should be? I need to read more books. <laughs> I used to read books all the time, and now I feel like it's been a while. Uh, what about you? I know you're very well read. I probably give off that impression more than I actually am well read. Um, to me, what I list as my favorite book ever is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. It's by Michael, I don't even know, how, Chabon? I don't know how you pronounce his last name. It's one of those last names I've always seen written but never heard pronounced. C-H-A-B-O-N. And um, that's an... I think I got you to read that one, Brian. That's like this amazing panorama of these two comic creators' lives and like the evolution of their comic book character and how it kind of changes the course of their lives in different ways. And I feel like that would be a good HBO miniseries. Like that's the treatment a lot of books are getting these days. Yeah, that's a really good example. I was just about to say that, yes, I read that book on your recommendation. You did a series where you were talking about your favorite pieces of media. So I, I tracked that one down. And it was not a negligible time investment. The book is like 600 plus pages long. But I really enjoyed it. 
and you're right that it would make a good movie. It kind of tells a fictionalized story of the creation of Superman by Siegel and Shuster. Right. Uh, it's another um, alliterative pair. We got Cavalier and Clay in the book. And yeah, a lot of really cinematic scenes. There's like a scene in the Empire State Building as it's being built. And it's like brand new in the King Kong 1930s days. And uh, they go to the Futurama at the 1939 World's Fair. There's a lot of really juicy period details in that book that, yeah, made me want to hop in and, and be in that that Gilded Age. Yeah, there's a there's a Nazi fight in Antarctica. Yeah, definitely. That's one where I had movie scenes playing in my head. So, right. good pull. I, I have two other specific books that are obscure enough that I am sure they will never be adapted, but I just want to see on screen. And they are both young adult comedy books. One of them is called Tales of the Madman Underground, which is this like weirdly long stream of consciousness novel about this kid in the, I guess the seventies who is in a therapy group and he wants to escape from the therapy group, but manages to get sucked back in. And there's like this quasi romance with this new student. And I just, I want to see these scenes in real life. It's like, I've read that book three times. I actually just reread it and I want to see these scenes in real life. Um, and I wanted a, a condensed version of the story because it is kind of sprawling. It's like several hundred pages. Um, the other one is this book that I'm not sure anyone else on the planet has ever actually read. I've actually traded emails with the author because I love the book so much. And it's called Carter Finally Gets It. It was also on my list of favorite media things. It was like in the 80s or something like that. And it is this absolutely hilarious story of this idiot kid in high school who like stumbles through a year. I think it's his freshman year and like makes every single wrong decision. And it has like the most epic party scene described that I can recall. And my wife says that she would always know I was rereading that book because I would just be start cracking up in the middle of like in our bedroom or in the middle of the dining room while I was reading it. It's one of those few books that gets me to laugh out loud. So I've actually one time tried to take the book and uh, write my screenplay version of it because I'm sure that it will never be made. And I thought it would be a fun writing exercise, but. I never actually got around to finishing it, but I think that would be a fun thing to do sometime. Oh, man. Yeah, you should uh, make the movie. <laughs> I think Disney owns the rights to the book. It was under the, a Disney label, so I don't know if I would be able to option that very easily. Oh, wow. You know, there's a Stephen King program where if his if something that he wrote has not been made into a movie yet, and you're like a film student, you can request the rights to do it basically it's like mail him a dollar and you can make the film but of course being stephen king there's like vanishingly few of his stories left over that haven't been made into something but there is a a wikipedia like list of stephen king dollar projects i don't think that's the official name but it's something like that uh frank darabont i think did one uh, and then went on to make the Green Mile movie and Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, both based off Stephen King properties. Yeah, I knew there was one famous director, and I think it is Frank Darabont, who got, when he was a student or an early director, made use of that program. Because, of course, the stipulation is, if you're licensing it for a dollar, it you can't commercialize the, the film itself without further negotiating a contract. So it's mostly student films. But I think that's an amazingly cool thing. I wish I was prolific and well-known and could do that to support young talent out there. I want to figure out more ways to support young talent. Like, Brian, I think we should get we should do an episode at some point of a student film project or something like that. Oh, I like that. This has been a fairly long prelude. The plot itself is not too heavy. Are you good if we, we dive into... Paper Towns 2015 and and its story, and then we can maybe get to some some discussion and some good things, not so good things, and perhaps some comparisons to the book. Yeah, let's go. So this movie stars 
Quentin Jacobson, who is referred to as Q throughout the story. And he opens the movie narrating, speculating that everyone gets a miracle. He claims that his miracle was growing up next door to Margot Roth Spiegelman in his suburban Orlando, Florida home. Could they have picked a more Jewish name? I don't know. It's like <laughs> Judith Rubenstein or Naomi Rosenblatt. So Spiegelman actually means mirror person. German? You said German? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a pretty prominent German uh, newspaper called Der Spiegel. And that was a intentional choice by Green, because as we'll see, a major theme of this book is the way that Quentin projects himself onto his image of what Margot is. Um, and I also think it's notable that her initials MRS are Mrs. And how Quentin also basically views her as a like token manic pixie dream girl that he's madly in love with without imagining her complexly. But I agree with you. The sound of it does sound kind of Jewishy. So when they were 10 years old, Q and Margot went out to play and discovered a dead body in the park of a man that killed himself. And this is kind of the first indication Q gets that he and Margot are different spirits, if somewhat kindred in their connection. But he finds himself eager to move on and be comforted by his parents, whereas she immerses herself in the mystery of who is this man who killed himself and beckons him to come out of his bedroom window and join her on this mystery, which he declines to do a scenario that will be paralleled not too far in the future of this story. But yeah, we've got here early on this abrupt note of darkness where they find this corpse and she seems very affected by it more so than he is. The story jumps ahead eight years with the little montage of them growing up. And we see that as high school graduation approaches, the two have drifted very far apart. Although Quentin is definitely still in love with her from afar. Margot is a very popular girl, hangs with the popular crowd, and she has an almost mythological reputation for getting into crazy adventures and disappearing and leaving behind clues and mysteries, which, spoiler, will be relevant for the rest of the story here. I thought it was kind of interesting that she's both the manic pixie dream girl and the most popular girl in school. I feel like that's not usually the way the combination works. You know, often the pixie girl is manic enough that she's kind of on the fringes in a way. And it takes the nice guy, gloomy loser to like recognize her spark and be charmed by it. So this book was written before the term Manic Pixie Dream Girl was normalized. And I think it is not textbook Manic Pixie Dream Girl, for sure, the, her character. But I do think there is something to what you're saying, how, what is the famous Walt Whitman quote? Um, I contain multitudes, how it's important to the story that it's not very clear exactly what Margot's identity is. Is she the wild person? Is she the the stereotypical blonde popular girl? Uh, is she the girl next door for Quentin? And the book actually does a much better job reckoning with that than the movie does. The, the book spends a lot more time thinking about the Walt Whitman poem, Song of Myself, which plays an important part in, a, in the mystery, which we'll get to in a minute. But Basically, like the book is almost John Green interpolating Song of Myself and its various themes upon Margot Roth Spiegelman. And like the various, the exact symbol he uses is grass in the book. And there's like a whole bit about how everybody sees grass differently and thinks about grass differently, and how basically Quentin is the same way towards Margot, and everyone in their town is the same way towards Margot. And Walt Whitman had the book Leaves of Grass. Right. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's the 
the title, yeah. I don't really think you can argue that she's at least somewhat of a manic pixie dream girl, though, at least here in this movie, because she writes everything in camel case, which is just <laughs> exhausting. I yeah. I could not deal with that. She says something like, the rules are unfair to the letters at the start of words, or something, that... how. How dare only letters at the starts of words be capitalized? And, I mean, it's tiring to read Camel Case. It's got to be tiring to write it, too. And, but And she just does it all the time. It's all over. Uh, uppercase, lowercase, all sca- scrambled around. That kind of thing is John Green at his more eye roll ish It exists in a muted form in the book. In the book, it she doesn't do it camel case. But she does it, she capitalizes random words in the sentence. So just the first letter, but of random words in the sentence. And they changed it in the movie so that it would be like more instantly recognizable and more striking. But I am with you that it's certainly quirky, let's say. Oh, I also wanted to call out uh, in this little montage of them growing up. There's a scene that takes place in, like, 2007 or 2008, round about the time that the book came out. And it's Halloween, and we see that Q is dressed as a vintage iPod. And Margot passes by, and she's on the arm of some jock, and the jock is dressed as a Spartan from 300. And that is just peak 2007 Halloween. (laughs) Uh, I remember my senior year of high school um, at the high school Dan and I went in at the high school Dan and I went to homecoming was a really big deal. And the week leading up to it, like every day was a theme day that got tons of participation and it would really just take over the school day. And I was very invested in the process to the point that by senior year, I was kind of steering a lot of it. And I was pushing for there to be a number theme. Interesting. (laughs) Not to go too far into the weeds, although, you know, we love to do that. The way that it worked was that every year there would be a overarching theme rule. So... (laughs) One year, the overarching theme rule was called Conjunction Junction. And so every class's sub-theme had to have a conjunction in the name. <laughs> so, like... That's like and, butter, or, right? Right, so it had to have and in there somewhere. So just really <laughs> overly broad in that case. Right. Uh, for instance, that was my freshman year, and our theme was called... Homer versus Homer. And it was a combination of The Simpsons and The Odyssey. Okay. It was interesting. Very abstruse. Uh, not the best one. But my recommendation was have the overarching theme rule be... It has to have a number in it. And mm. you could have, like, I don't know, three blind mice, and it's like... N- n- nursery rhymes overall or I-, I don't know exactly that was that was my pitch was have this number theme role is the the connection here to 300 for the the Spartans it is thank you for steering me back because <laughs> what it got watered down to was uh not a class theme but a day theme was going to be numbers and so The whole football team basically came as Spartans from 300. Of course, if you're 17 and you're ripped, why not be shirtless? But back to, I guess, 2007-ish in the film. But, or I I don't know exactly when this, I guess it was a couple years after that. Yeah, I I think the events of the film are uh, understood to be taking place when the movie came out in 2015. Because this... 2007 scene is definitely, you know, not a flashback, but like in this passage of time sequence. Right. Okay. Yeah. And we meet Q's friends in high school. So 
one thing that is alluded at in the movie, but laid out explicit in the book, is that all of Q's friends are band geeks, but Q himself is not in band. But I appreciated how their social lives revolved around the band room. One of Q's friends is Ben, who is a kind of scrawny and pathetic guy, but he's very overconfident, and he, he cannot get a date to save his life. And his other best friend is Radar, a geeky black kid who has just gotten his first girlfriend, the first girlfriend of the three, in fact, and her name is Angela. And both characters are pretty well fleshed out, both of these side characters, but Radar in particular has two notable personality traits that play into the film. One is that he is a leading editor of what is a stand-in for Wikipedia. It's called Omnictionary in the book in the movie. And so he's always like editing and bringing things up on Omnictionary. That just doesn't roll off the tongue at all. I wish he just said Wikipedia. Yeah, I, I don't know why he didn't. Maybe he picked it for like, like he didn't want to, I don't know, copyright infringement or breaking of reality. want to be like, imagine Wikipedia, but not quite Wikipedia. I agree with you, though. And the other thing about him, which is one of the highlights of the story for me, is that his parents have the world's largest collection of black Santas. And a, a funny story for me on this one is I, in the book, Radar is just consistently exasperated about the fact that he his, lives in a house filled with black Santas. And when I was reading this book, I think it was the very first time I read it. I was actually flying to Hawaii for my honeymoon in 2012. And I was laughing so hard on the plane that my wife told me that I needed to take a break from reading because I was embarrassing her with how much I was laughing as I was reading. But they had a lot of fun, like digging out and making various black Santa props as they revealed this fact about radar. Yeah. And it's not just at Christmas time. The house is full of these things all year round. And right. it's the reason radar can't bring his girlfriend to his house. <laughs> and yeah, actually this was the one thing I knew about this story going in that my brother had passed along to me was <laughs> the tale of the black Santa collection. Yeah, it, it's pretty good. In the commentary, John Green said that when they hired the one of the production designers, basically, like, they asked for as much budget as they could get for the Black Santa stuff and just went to town for weeks finding Black Santa things, making Black Santa things, and that he got to keep a couple of them from the filming and... I appreciated that, the, the dedication they put to this bit, because it was certainly one of the iconic bits of this story for me. So we, we see Q and Ben and Radar on kind of a normal high school day, and they pass Margot in the halls, and what seems to, again, be kind of normal high school stuff. But then that night when Q goes to bed, he is awoken by Margot at the window of his bedroom again for the first time since that night when they discovered a body when they were 10 years old and she invites him on an adventure. Basically she says she needs his car and she wants him to come with her and they go out for a night of mischief and Q, unlike when he was 10 says yes this time and goes, goes out with her. Um, their night starts by going to a store, which is, it was really an ingenious way to set up the story because Margo is being tight-lipped about the plans, but we see her listing out the things she's going to need for the plans, and it just gets the imagination running. She needs whole raw catfish, spray paint, about a dozen rolls of saran wrap, Vaseline, uh, hair-removing Nair cream. I don't know if you've ever used or encountered Nair, Brian, and um, a couple other things, an air horn and stuff, but... Um, I, I like this scene when they have to get all the supplies for their adventure together. I have not used Nair. I was curious if it really works as fast as depicted in the film. Oh, it does. It's it's. I don't know how it works or what it what its deal is. 
like I feel like people don't talk about the fact that we have technology to remove hair by just applying cream enough. Like to me, that's a miracle of science. But w- there was a guy and I went to high school with who was a little bit of a weird, wild guy. And one night at a party, he bought this huge tube of Nair and put it in his hair, like squeezed the whole thing into his hair and started playing video games and would just like every now and then grab his towel and like wipe part of his head and he would just be completely bald underneath it. And it was weirdly gross. It was one of the strangest things I've ever seen. So if you're ever looking to do something weird that will uh, get a reaction from a crowd, there's one option. Well, I am often looking for things like that, so I might have to keep it in mind. Although right now I'm trying to keep my hair. I don't uh, yeah. I don't want it going anywhere. If you like clear your, shave your head or I suppose nair your head at our age, people assume that you are going bald and embarrassed by that. I did shave off one of my eyebrows at one point to mm. see how long it would take to grow back, and it was about three weeks. Okay. So after they get all their supplies, we see their their night of mischief begin, and it's Margot basically getting revenge on everyone who's wronged her, primarily her cheating boyfriend and her best friend who he's cheating on. And they, they go there first. Um, they have a whole little thing where they manage to get um, them caught hooking up late in the middle of the night. They leave a fish behind to rot. This is actually where John Green has his cameo because there's a moment where Becca, the the best friend, her dad shouts, I've got a gun or something like that. And that was John Green's one appearance in the film. Apparently there was much debate about what his cameo was going to be according to the, the commentary, but they settled on a very tiny one of him shouting one line as Becca's dad. Does he have a cameo in Fault in Our Stars? You know, I don't actually know that. I, I'm not sure. He was not an executive producer on The Fault in Our Stars, I don't think, but he is an executive producer here. So I'm not aware of one in The Fault in Our Stars. He, I don't think he has one in Looking for Alaska either, which he is an executive producer on. Some of the other pranks that we get to see that night, they saran wrap a car on uh, of Lacey, who is another one of Margot's friends, and we'll actually get to know Lacey a bit later throughout the film. Right. So the character Becca is one of Margot's friends and her boyfriend, Margot's boyfriend is cheating on Margot with Becca. And Margot assumes that Lacey knows about all of this. And so that's why she's part of this collateral damage too. Right. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for clarifying that. The mechanics are not all that important, but if you kind of rush through it, it's kind of confusing. Why are, who, Why do we care about all these people? The answer ends up being we don't really care about the specifics of them all that much. But Lacey is an important one to note because she becomes a lens on how not only do people see Margot Roth Spiegelman not complexly, but in fact, Margot Roth Spiegelman does not see others complexly. And then they do use the Nair. The nair they use on this guy named Chuck, who's just kind of your generic bully type that we don't see too much of. But they it's great. They nair one eyebrow of his. So that goes back to your shaving one eyebrow anecdote. And uh, they Vaseline his doorknob so that when he tries to chase after them, he can't open the door. Oh, one more thing about shaving off your eyebrows. You look uh-huh. really unhealthy with no eyebrows. Like you look like something is really wrong inside if you have no eyebrows. So if you don't want to give off that impression, I would not recommend doing it. I like that it was only one eyebrow they did because then you you put a dilemma for the other for the person, the victim. Like what would you do in that scenario? Would you clear your other eyebrow? Would you just live with one eyebrow? Would you like pencil on a fake second eyebrow? If you already have only one missing, I don't know, but I thought that was like a a good twist on the the prank rather than doing both. Sure. Well, what I did, I know, was I just let the other one grow back. Gotcha. So as each of these pranks are unfolding, Q finds himself drawn into the exciting, impulsive energy that Margot carries with her. 
And as their pranks wrap up, uh, the last task is basically, it's not really a task itself. It's admiring the damage they've done from afar. Margot knows a security guard at a local skyscraper and they go up to one of the top floors and they look down on the town that they grew up in and just terrorized. And while they're up there looking down, Margot says, I, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't know if this is an verbatim, it's a paper town. All those paper houses and paper streets, and the people are paper too. This is the first time we hear the phrase paper towns. In the movie, we basically get two iterations of paper towns. In the book, Q's understanding of the phrase evolves a little bit more, but we it will become an important it is of course the title of the film and will be a important phrase later on and i want to set kind of the tone of this sequence as they're running around pulling these madcap pranks because it seems like on the one hand it's like zany and they're you know just painting the town red but there's this moment when we get this like shocked and sad reaction shot from Margot, and this is after the boyfriend has come running out of Becca's house in the nude and Q looks at her and is like, what's wrong? And she says, well, part of me thought it might not be true. And then they go back to the wild pranks but there's, you know, a moment of pathos and of sadness and darkness. And I was wondering how dark things were going to get as the movie progressed. Definitely. I, I agree with all of that. There's an air of, of looming danger that how much will that come to fruition as everything happens here. So they're, they're up on this, the skyscraper looking down and... There's like this Muzak playing in the background and they share a tender moment of like, I don't know, shared reflection and basically have a slow dance to Lady in Red. Uh, I did a not original version of it, a kind of cheesed up version of it, but it's this cute little scene. And to me, Lady in Red will always be the song from this YouTube video Dan showed me a long time back of this choreographed canoe performance <laughs> that this old man t does on a lake during some kind of competition for whatever this art form is. Uh, I think the contest called it Freestyle Canoe, but he's pirouetting in a canoe to Lady in Red <laughs> is dancing with me. It's just a, a beautiful video. I mean, in every sense. It it also has some of the funniest comments I've ever seen on a YouTube video. Is You must both mock and honor this man, this amazing freestyle canoeist. But yeah, I'm glad that that one stuck with you. Yeah, so that's what was coming to mind and, and will forevermore when I hear that song. <laughs> their evening comes to an end. They they drive back to their houses and say goodnight and have this somewhat ominous exchange. Will things be different tomorrow? Q says, and Margo says, I hope so. Um, and to Q, that is a... He has an optimistic reading of this that perhaps... Now Margot will be more available to him. Maybe tonight was the start of something special. But we will quickly see his reading was not the correct reading of this scene. For the next day at school, Margot is not there, which makes Q a little uneasy. But that unease is amped up when he arrives home from school and Margot's parents and a detective show up and share that Margot has disappeared. The Margot's parents seem to just be exhausted by everything that is, as the youths would say nowadays, extra about Margot and her kind of always disappearing and, and being a high maintenance teenager. 
I'm sure they're sick of her camel case, too. Yeah, probably. Q, of course, is very concerned because she disappeared immediately on the heels of their big connection. Of course, one thing we know about Margot is when she disappears, she leaves clues, and Q immediately starts looking for them, and he notices one when he looks out his bedroom window to Margot's bedroom window, which we had seen during their kind of growing up phase, that that's how they would greet each other. There's a similar thing, sorry, this is a tangent here, in the music video for You Belong With Me, where Taylor Swift and this the main male protagonist of that music video have have childhood bedrooms opposite each other. And my thought is always just like, you know the horny teenage guy is trying to peep into that window at least once a week. Yeah, I wonder how many houses are actually laid out like this, where you can look directly across and, you know, send smoke signals to each other. Right. I think they kind of stagger them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. And they're also, like, I don't know, pretty close to each other. I don't know. But it is very cinematic. And it's it's a good metaphor that works even better in the book about how they're sort of connected, but there's, like, this invisible thing between them that they can't quite pierce and that is emphasized a little bit in the book yes it's sort of like a knock three times scenario (laughs) something like that which uh by the way i you didn't bring it up but uh part of the miracle speech at the start of the movie when q is talking about just you know how he instantly fell in love with Margot. And that he was lucky enough that they spent their childhoods together. He says, due to no fluke that I can discern beyond simply living close to one another and being similar in age, we were each other's constant companions. And you know what that's called, Dan? (laughs) Is that propinquity? It's propinquity. They don't use the word, which I am surprised since John Green is a wordsmith. But that's what is being described. <laughs> yeah, that is a phenomenon, though, for sure. Like, my, my good friends growing up, the guy who I said I'm going to vote for for president someday, like, I would have had no reason to have been friends with him, except he lived next door to me. So, you know, it's, it's a real thing. So, again, this first clue, Q notices a Woody Guthrie poster hanging in her window. And he gets his way into Margot's room by bribing Margot's little sister, uh, along with Radar and Ben. And because now they're, they, he's determined he's going to hunt down Margot. He's going to solve the mystery. So they go into her room and look through the albums in her room and find a Wilco album that has the poster, even though there, it's not, in fact, a Woody Guthrie album, the album sleeve has this poster on it. And one of the songs on the album is called Walt Whitman's Niece. And it has been circled by Margot, which then leads them to find a copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which is sitting on her bedside table. They grab that and flip through it. And in the poem Song of Myself, the lines unscrew the locks from the doors, unscrew the doors themselves from their jams, is highlighted, which is the next clue for Q. And these clues happen in pretty quick succession here in the movie. The next one is he, he looks at some door hinges before seeing in his own door hinge that Margot left him a little note stuck in the door jams that is an address. So she's not only hiding clues in her house, she also had the time and access to hide clues in his house. So she was invested in this. She put some yeah. time into laying this thing out. We're getting into national treasure territory. Right. I think that's a good point, because your potential takeaway, ultimate takeaway on Margot, we'll get to it in a bit. This is something that could color that. I have a couple other things that color it for me as well, which we'll get to. And so Q, I mean, is presenting this series of breadcrumbs to his friends and they're exploring them together. And so the conclusion they come to is, wow, she's really into you, dude. And that is like not an unreasonable read, I gotta say, because 
It's not like she left that note in her door. Right. If she had left that note in her door, then it would have been, it could have been anyone who discovered it. But the fact that it was his door specifically makes it clear that he is the target audience for this. Yeah, I don't think he's jumping too far to conclusions here. So he follows that address with his friends, and it leads them to this abandoned strip mall, which they break into. Although there's this gag where they feel like they have to break into it because they can't pull the door open, and then someone leans on the door, and it turns out to be a push door, and they can just go straight in. It's a classic gag. I think I watched it in Looney Tunes recently, too. And inside this souvenir store, we get more spooky, deathly vibes, for sure. It's dark, and everything is decaying. And there's no sign of Margot, which, of course, Q is hoping that that's where she's disappeared to. But there is spray-painted on the wall the phrase, you will go to the paper towns, and you will never come back. Which, again, is a fairly ominous phrasing there. So we don't know where she's at. Obviously nobody does. We'll get more into this later, but I was starting to suspect that she may either have killed herself by this point or was going to. And we'll we'll talk more about whether that was a founded supposition. I mean, th- this whole thing is a mystery story, so you're leading to some kind of payoff, perhaps some kind of twist. I was trying to calculate what the ending was going to be, and I'll, I'll say now that I thought the twist might be that. Sure. Well, I, I will say this. The movie kind of talks around it. The book ver- has a significant phase where Q thinks that she has killed herself because... First of all, because a lot of these clues are ominous. And second of all, if she hadn't killed herself, she, of course, is into him. Why would she not have revealed herself to him yet? I mean, he's doing what he's supposed to do, finding the clues, and he hit a dead end. And, But it's also more than that, because we get this very prominent scene at the start of a suicide victim being discovered, and Margot being very impacted by that. Yes, that is a good call. And I'll say the the movie, well, we'll see what kind of payoff it has in that regard, but it is not very much. It kind of drops the ball on this thread, I thought. Yeah. Uh, I understand that the book has a little more of it. Yes. It's also interesting in the arc of John Green, his most famous book at this point was Looking for Alaska, which involves a death of a character in an impactful way that I think it's good that he didn't go that route for the sake of not being the guy who always writes about the character who who dies unexpectedly partway through the story. But I think you're you're not far off in saying that this movie leaves a lot of hints that that could that is what could be happening and then doesn't follow through on it in a I mean we're admit, we're just saying right now she does not kill herself. That is not the outcome here. I know this uh we try to talk through the plot without jumping too far ahead as we go. But the fact that she is not dead now, some of these are kind of red herrings that feel like weird, twisted red herrings, I suppose. Now that they've kind of made it to this abandoned building, they don't really have any more leads. And so we spend the next quarter of the movie or so with him kind of stuck here. And and while Q is still completely absorbed in the mystery and like convinced that that's what he has to do and kind of expects all of his friends to be just as obsessed with it as he is. They're kind of starting to move on a little bit. So the group, as we mentioned, connects with Lacey. Lacey kind of had heard that Q was with her the night she disappeared and begins talking with him and then with their group and they, their paths start intersecting um, in general, the whole group, which had been depicted as outcasts at the, or at least geeks at the beginning of the story, gets sucked into the social world, perhaps seemingly buoyed by this mystique around Q, given that he was with Margot the night she disappeared and has some sort of cachet now, because he was able to to be a part of that and pull off all these pranks on people. It reminded me a little of some kind of wonderful how 
through a twist of fate, uh, perpetual nothing, Eric Stoltz has <laughs> spent a magical night with the most popular girl, and suddenly he is buoyed, and he's in this rarefied territory all of a sudden, and everybody kind of has to accept him as a force to be reckoned with now. Perpetual nothing, Eric Stoltz, is a good turn of phrase. I think I, I'm going to keep that one in my arsenal for the future of this podcast. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's when suddenly the character <laughs> is punching above their weight. And we had this one night where things seemed to be going well uh, between Q and Margo. She kind of summoned him from obscurity. And we have yet to see whether that's going to continue. Uh, a couple episodes ago, I think on the podcast, I told the story of a Arabian Nights movie where in one of the tales, a beggar gets pranked and, uh, well, what's the Ashton Kutcher show? Punked uh, by a guy, like some some nobleman. Sets things up where one day the beggar awakes in the palace and is told, you're not a beggar, you're the sultan. You've always been the sultan. And then just when he's finally accepted this new reality that he's the sultan, he's going to wake up suddenly back out in the street again. And that sort of thing obviously fucks with your head. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's kind of what happens to Q because he is totally on the outside and then he's extremely in, in the inside with Margo for a night. And then he is back to, it's not exactly where he was, but he's definitely that the, the carryover of that is, is not a hundred percent. Right. But still at this point, you know, he's got the legend going for him. And his friends are thinking that something is perhaps going to come of this. Right. And, and as this is going, the, the characters are all encountering the lastness of everything. That is your last month or two of uh, senior year of high school. A phase I distinctly remember where, like, on the one hand, I was kind of tired of everything and everyone. On the other hand, <laughs> it was kind of incomprehensible to think about the fact that this was never going to happen again because it had been my reality for, at that point, like more than a quarter of my life. And it also, for me, was amplified by the fact that I really did not want to leave high school. I, I've mentioned recently on the podcast that that was probably the best year of my life, certainly up there for me. But yeah, um, they're all kind of getting ready for prom and stuff, graduation. And they go to their, of course, end of high school big party. But this time they actually get invited and... Ben, the kind of doofy friend, manages to get totally drunk, totally shit-faced, and he hits on Lacey, and it's it was fun to see them kind of all hanging out at a party. Yeah, I like these friends. They have good chemistry. Yeah, one, to me, that's a major strength of the film, is the chemistry between the friends is amazing, and apparently, like, the party and some of the scenes where they're hanging out in the room... What actually made it in the movie is is bears very little resemblance to what was in the script because basically these people had inhabited their characters really well. And so the director and John Green were like, yeah, like be Ben and Radar for two minutes talking about how we don't believe that Ben had a real fake girlfriend back in summer camp. And so like what was actually there was totally improvised. And it's really good. Like, I, you believe that these people are actually friends. Yeah, it made me glad that partway through the movie, I turned on the subtitles to catch some of these exchanges. Uh, because there's one that I heard that happened off screen that I, I think is between Ben and Radar. Uh, but you hear one of them say, you need aglets to exist. <laughs> and the other one says, I agree I need aglets, but to exist? And aglets are the plastic pieces at the ends of your shoelaces. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So I'm glad that that little weird high school friend exchange did not end up on the cutting room floor. 
It's there yeah. at the periphery, adding world depth. One thing that John Green said in the, or maybe it was the director, Jake Schreer said in the commentary, is that they they would like do an hour's worth of takes of them just improvising on a couple of scenes. And it made them want to do a movie that was just the three characters hanging out for a few days. And they felt like that would have been an enjoyable movie in and of itself. And I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, that's not too far off from what we've got. I mean, the only way (laughs) to make this more of a quintessential Dan movie pick would be to have it take place over one night. And uh, this takes place over a couple. I I mean, it actually takes place over a pretty long span of time. But there are like a handful of very consequential and dense nights. Yes, that is an astute point. Yeah, I think you could also cut down on the missing girl mystery and it would be a little more peak Dan. But you're definitely right that this hits a lot of Dan check marks. But at that party, Q gets his next big break in the missing Margot story because he goes to a bedroom and finds a map book. I think this is at Becca's house, so one of the best friends that Margot felt had betrayed her and finds in the map book that Margot had torn out a page and doodled something and it gets him thinking about the old maps that had been focused on in some of the shots of the abandoned strip mall. And so he hurries back there and this, I think this is the visit. Like he, he visits this place at least three times. And in one of these has to me, like the single scene that, that is the biggest improvement upon the book. And that is the, they're scared because it's dark and they're at like this creepy old abandoned place. And Ben, I think it's the party because I think Ben is recovering from his drunkenness, says, you're scared, man. You know what makes something not scary is if you're singing. And they start singing the theme song to the Pokemon TV show. And they, I think they get like the whole theme song, at least the portion that appears on the TV show. And just, I've mentioned before, one of my favorite tropes is when characters sing out of the blue in a non-musical movie. I really enjoyed that bit. I liked it too, although it felt like the time might not line up because I could totally see our age group doing this. People who would have been high school seniors in 2007 when the book came out. I... Don't know if the first season theme song is what high school seniors in 2015 would remember so fondly. But maybe. I could see it still being a meme. But, you know, once we got into Johto and other later seasons of Pokemon, the theme (laughs) song changed. So who can really say? That's interesting. It makes me wonder, like, when this is actually supposed to have taken place. Like, is it 2015... Or is it, in fact, 2008? Because if it had been 2015, then, like, the flashback of them in the iPod would have been well before they were 18. I I guess you're right. That's not the sense that we get, so I'm not sure. Maybe it's 2009 or something. Anyways, there was a good anecdote in the commentary, and that is that they knew they wanted to have a singing scene here at this point in the film, and they were initially going to do Party in the USA, And they actually filmed that and someone, and I think they said the person who it was, was the actress who played Margot's sister, saw them filming that or like heard about it and said, oh, is that supposed to be in reference to Pitch Perfect where they also sing that song? And apparently they went and watched that and there's an acapella version of Party in the USA in that and they felt it was too close so they needed a different song. So they tried a whole bunch of different songs And they filmed a couple. I think they filmed the Taylor Swift one. John Green had the idea for the DuckTales theme song. He's like, oh, that's a great song. Everyone loves that. And he went and pitched it to the actors. And they're like, eh, that's too old for us. We don't know that. Like, I've heard the song, but it's not iconic to us. And then apparently, like, as this conversation was happening, the actress Halston Sage, who plays Lacey, was like, what about if you want to do a TV theme song? What about Pokemon? And like when she said that, 
the three guys just out of the blue started singing it. Like they weren't filming. It was like mentioned and they started singing it and everyone was singing it together. And that was when the director and John Green knew that that had to be the one that they had to include in the film. So I appreciated that, that making of anecdote. I thought that was good. Yeah. I liked that quite a bit, but they do in fact find a map and it lines up nicely on a wall with some push pin holes. And in fact, this push pin image would be the icon that is used on the cover of reprints of the book as you see the push pin. But they realize that the map lays out a kind of route for a road trip. And the final destination is a place called Aglo, New York, which they look up on Omnictionary. It is in fact a paper town. And in this case, we know that paper towns are otherwise called copyright traps towns that were put on maps by publishing companies so that they knew that if it appeared on other companies' maps, that those companies had just copied the map because they put in something that wasn't actually there. And if the other places were doing their own research, they never would have put this town there. And Aglo is one of the more famous ones, and it has its own Omnictionary page where Margot has left a comment, and we know it's Margot because of the camel case, where she says that the population of Aglo is one, indicating that she has positioned herself exactly where Aglo, New York, should be, were it a real city. Although we do learn that there is a general store that is said to be the Aglo general store there in the town. I don't know how much they spotlight that on the movie, but that is something in the book that there is an Aglo general store. Yeah, it's, it's like this wooden structure that's right. there. At the mile marker. This is everything the group needs to hear. They hop in the car. They're going to go up to Aglo with the one wrinkle that they have just enough time to get there and back in time for prom. Because going up to New York from Florida is a long ass drive. It's like a thousand miles or something like that. Yeah, so this was a timely pick for a movie this week, it turns out, because a few days ago... My brother actually drove down to Orlando, Florida to start working at Disney World. Mm. And, of course, he's the one who's the John Green fan, so he yeah. was familiar with this. I think he said that as he was driving around Orlando, he was looking for the SunTrust building, right. which is the building that they scale at the start and have their Lady in Red dance. <laughs> It's a pretty epic road trip, despite only happening in like the last 25 minutes or half hour of the, the film. Um, it has plenty of ups and downs in that time period. So they, they have this really memorable stop at a gas station that is one of the better scenes in the book and also works pretty well here in the movie, where because they're in such a rush, they have it all planned out where they're like rushing in and trying to hurry their way out of the gas station so they don't lose too much time on their road trip and they end up getting dorky t-shirts for each other and stuff uh, the black character inadvertently grabs a heritage not hate with a confederate flag that does appear in the book and the commentary revealed that they almost cut that joke because of how political it was yeah especially in 2015 and i mean and henceforth but like especially in 2015 Right. Oh, and they nearly have a collision with a poorly CGI'd cow on the road. Although I thought it was CGI'd. I think maybe they were saying in the commentary they interacted with the cow, or maybe they were thinking talking about something else. I can't remember. I thought the cow looked CGI'd. But anyways, they almost hit a cow on the road, and Ben pulls the wheel at the last second as Q is panicking and while driving, and they swerve off the road. And... They're waiting, I guess, for AAA to fix their tire or something like that. But during that break, uh, Radar loses his virginity with Angela, and Ben and Lacey agree to go to prom together when they get back. Very eventful. Well, Lacey swoons because Ben saved their lives. And this felt a little abrupt to me because there was a scene like 90 seconds before where Ben was peeing in the car in a bottle and like made a big mess. Oh man, the description of Ben peeing in the bottle is the second funniest thing in the book, but besides the, the Black Santas, the way that John, I almost want to find the quote and read it out loud. I don't think I'll subject you all to that, but um, 
That always made me laugh really hard in the book. But yeah, you're right. I was wondering, have you ever had to do that, Dan? No, I have. I don't. Uh, no, I've never done that. Have you? I've done it once. And it was in like a Gatorade bottle. And mm. even that was like a little too small. When, <laughs> when you need to urinate, it's a considerable amount. More than you would think. Right. Uh, he does it in a soda can in the movie. And then has to grab a second soda can and is able to flawlessly make the transition. But then, of course, they hit a bump. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good, good, disgusting comic beat. Uh, but I also liked the scene of Radar hooking up with the girlfriend because first, of course, he has to confess. The girl asks, why have you never brought me to your house? And he tells the story of the Black Santa collection. And, you know, she kind of says, oh, no, no, it's fine. It's charming. And... <laughs> He says, you won't think so when you're eating your breakfast cereal with your Black Santa spoon. <laughs> and I loved picturing that in my head, that it's so granular down to the cutlery is Black Santa somehow. That's pretty good. Their road trip finally reaches an end in Aglo, New York, and they get to the Aglo General Store. And they open the, the wooden doors and they look inside, um, expecting to see her there, but she is not there. And they search around for a bit, but remember they're kind of on a time crunch to make it back in time for prom. And so everyone's kind of disappointed, of course. They get into a little bit of an argument about whether to stay and keep looking, because Q, of course, wants to keep looking. The rest want to get back to prom, but... They ultimately decide that Q is going to stay and everyone else is going to go back. And so Q kind of hangs around for a bit. It must not be that long, like literally just a couple of hours, but Margot doesn't appear. And so he decides he's just going to go back as he's buying a bus ticket to Orlando to kind of make his way back. He, he finally spots someone who looks like Margot and he, he goes outside and he calls out Margot and turns around, and it is in fact her. It's Kara De Delavine. I think that's how you pronounce. I don't think I've said her name yet. The, the actress who plays Margot. And so F Q has finally found her alive and well, just outside Aglo, New York. And it is not the reaction that Q is expecting. She is just very surprised that he did all this. And apparently, the clues were to be a hint that everything that had happened was part of the plan of that night. And that she is okay, that not that, that uh, he was supposed to follow her. So they begin having this conversation that's kind of the end of the film where they talk about what happened and about what she's going to do. And she's alive, but she is not going to go back with him. She's not going to be with him. Although she does ultimately kiss him and extend an invitation for him to come with her. So it, it's very ambiguous. Yeah. This this is weird because we get the kind of shocked, dismayed look from her of, oh, you're in love with me? Well, I'm flattered, but I don't feel that way. But then they talk for like a minute longer and then they're kissing and then she says, oh, you could come with me. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Did he win you over or what changed? Because you seemed pretty out of it at the start. So it's it's just another frustrating moment with Margot Spiegelman. Yeah, I agree. It's not very clear. And I learned from the commentary that they had to reshoot this because they thought their first version of it did not work. And I still feel like this moment doesn't fully land in terms of like knowing how we should feel about Margot. Yeah, it almost felt it almost felt like something where they like did a test screening and there was no kiss and the audience member said, "We need to we need to end the movie with a kiss." <laughs> and then they stuck it in and didn't really reckon with that. The kiss is actually in the book. I, I don't know if it was in the original version or not of the film before they reshot the ending, but I will say in the book 
it is also ambiguous, but it's a literary kind of ambiguous, and it's a thematic resolution about how the the key line of the book is what a treacherous thing to believe that a person is more than a person to basically like instead of like understanding that the person is someone acting of their own agency with their own internal lives that you view them as a reflection of your own again she is mirror person of what you expect her to be it's it's an example of something to me that is very much a book type of ending and not a movie type of ending and i think that does drag down the end of the film somewhat in my opinion but after they kind of have this exchange she he declines to go with her she declines to go back to orlando with him he manages to get back to orlando just in time to still make it to some of prom and so we see him doing his goofy dance with the the guys and getting to enjoy having finally let go of Margot, being able to actually enjoy the end of his high school life here. And in fact, they live happily ever after. The movie ends with a little snippet about what Margot was up to since then and some things that she might have done, like performing on Broadway and, and different things like that. But the last line is, but that's her story to tell, which I guess is their like compromise on still kind of having that theme in the movie, but not quite in the same way as the book. Yeah, so somewhat upbeat ending. Nobody dies in a car crash six months later or disappears in Vietnam. That's <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good American graffiti pull there. And that wraps Paper Towns 2015. So, Brian, let's talk some good and not so good things about this movie. Or just assorted thoughts, because that's really where my brain is at. Just some assorted reflections. Yeah, some things we want to say that we haven't said yet. I think maybe we can start with the cast. So, did you think Nat Wolf, the lead who played Q, is he good or not so good for you? He was fine to me. I didn't enjoy him quite as much as either of his friends uh, I mean, they were there to be funny, and I consistently found them so. Um, but as a lead, I, I mean, I think he did what he needed to do uh, in the sense that he, you know, is kind of an outsider. And he reads the clues in a certain way so as to become hopeful. And I definitely felt that and was along for the journey. What about you? What do you what did you think of his performance? I really like him. I think he's I think he's quite good. He, the character himself is a little bit of like a cipher almost for the the viewer in some regards. And he just manages to be very charming even as like I, I don't know, like talking a little bit more about the plot and some of its strengths and weaknesses. I think especially in movie more so than book you just get the sense that like, why do you actually care? And why are you still following this? Like clearly you could be having the time of your life with your buddies as a senior in high school, but he manages to like, not let that totally derail the movie. It's like, it's a good balance balancing act. And I, I just find him a charming presence in general. So yeah. I can't fully shake the naked brothers band connection. <laughs> Also, what kind of a that's name is that for you. a band that's on a children's channel? It's very strange to me. That is odd. I, I never thought about that. So on the flip side, the ostensible co-lead, although she disappears for the entire, entire middle half or so of the film, is Kara or Kara Delavine. Her name is spelled really weird. There's an extra N in there that I just would not have expected. Delavingini. So that's got a lot of letters yeah. in the mix. <laughs> what did you think of her? I know you had some thoughts on her. I did have some thoughts on her. So this is where I'm going to come across as a total uh, neckbeard choosing beggar meme. But I did not see what Q saw in Kara Delevingne. I thought she specifically had a very manly face. Uh, she's got kind of like a pug nose and just these very thick eyebrows. And I, 
at first when he's giving his miracle speech at the start of the movie, they're like little kids. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not seeing this love at first sight thing with this actress, but she's like eight. So that's probably good and healthy. Uh, but th I mean, the little girl they picked, I could totally see becoming Kara Levine. Same, same out of control brows at work here. <laughs> um, and then though, you know, then I start thinking, well, you know, maybe just this is who they could get. But then again, I acknowledge that I'm coming across as totally shallow. Then Lacey shows up. And what did you say that actress's name was? Halston somebody? Halston Sage. Okay. And this person is a bombshell. The <laughs> Halston Sage, like, yeah, that's where the double takes come in. But I don't know. Uh, so t solely on that aspect of it, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it was a perfect casting for someone that... You know, is the girl next door who rolled up in the moving truck and instantly you imprint on that person and that needs to be the one for you. I don't know if I got that sense. Right. Yeah, this was always going to be a tough part to cast for me because she is supposed to be so unimaginably attractive and also like dangerous and interesting and someone you would fall for. I think... So a couple things about her distinctive look. She has a background as a model prior to becoming an actress. And I think some of her, the things that you described as, as perhaps unattractive or at least weird looking for a uh, female co-star can be attributed to the fact that she was like a runway model. And I don't know if you've actually looked at runway models very much, but they tend to be like very strange and almost alien looking. And she definitely has some of that. Uh, it's like very, very sharp features. Right. And in particular, her eyebrows became her calling card. And I can see why that would be off-putting to you because like thick, somewhat untamed eyebrows is not typically a feminine trait. It is, it is very distinctive looking. And um, I think it's a mixed bag for me. She does have like a weird energy to her that I would believe in someone who does crazy things and how you might be like m more in love with that energy than with her looks. And I don't know, just like looking distinctive and not like your trademark, beautiful blonde woman kind of adds to it, but it also doesn't feel quite right. Sometimes she's a mixed bag as an actress. There are some times when she carries it and sometimes when she falls flat. Also, like, I'm not picky on the accents, but she is clearly hiding an accent. I don't know if you detected that one. Like, anytime she has to string together more than two sentences, you can hear her, like, trying really hard to not slip into her accent. I think she's maybe British or something like that, but um, that also bothered me a little bit. I think I noticed some of that. She definitely came across as strange, and I think it works well in the sense of being the quirky girl archetype mm -hmm. less so in the sense of being like the prom queen most popular girl archetype yeah so like you said i i think i agree mixed bag um hard to read uh, you've used the word cipher a couple times i think that's fitting other than that i think the cast is really good in this movie like i want to follow the careers of Basically, every other actor who appears, you mentioned Ben and Radar. I think they're awesome. They got great chemistry. They're funny. I liked the actress who played Lacey, the actress who played Angela, Radar's girlfriend. Just all around, a charming teen cast that I would have enjoyed spending even more time with, I think. And I think you mentioned you liked them as well. Oh, yeah. Consistently entertaining. And I, I particularly wanted to shout out the actor who played Ben. I think his name is Austin Abrams. So he, for me, is a weak part of the book. He's kind of annoying in the book. And he has a tick in the book that you see a couple times in the movie where he calls all females honey bunny. And in the book, it is far more grating than it is in the movie. 
I feel like he kind of toned down the annoyingness and amped up the charm while still basically being the same character. So I admired that. As for the story itself, so John Green is on the record as saying he, quote, has no use for plot. And I think that carries here. The more you think about the specifics of the plot, the less good and fun this movie becomes. The pacing is all weird. For some reason, like, you go back to the mall, like, three times. The mystery itself, the clues aren't all that interesting, I don't think. It's something that works, is, is more literary than it is adventure And I think that drags it down as an adaptation, I really do. I think it's not a, a perfect fit for, for cinema. I think it more or less holds together, but just the overall pace of the story is odd to me. It's not perfect. Yeah, the structure of the act is a little weird, too. Like, I felt that the road trip was probably the most entertaining part of the movie for me. And it's shoehorned into the third act. And it it just felt like they could have given a little bit more of the movie's runtime. It's funny, they've adapted, out of John Green's five novels, they've adapted three of them. And I feel like the one that is the most adaptable, which is An Abundance of Catherines, is one they haven't adapted. And that one is centered entirely around a road trip by a former child prodigy and his best friend. And that would have been a really fun movie. I want to see that made into a movie sometime. My point being, I agree with you. Like the, the road trip feels a little bit rushed. One annoying thing that is not in the book, but it's in the movie, but really bugged me from the story perspective is that Margot says she's been talking with her sister every day. But like, if that's actually true, the ex- like the fear if, if, that everyone has that she's dead, the ridiculous extents that Q is going to to find her, it feels kind of cruel by the sister to not be like, dude, she's alive and well and doesn't want you to track her down. Like the sister could have easily said something like that and Q would have moved on a little bit more easily. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why they had to add that into the, the movie. It would have saved everybody a lot of time. Oh, you're, or you're <laughs> right. that She could have just not said that line at the end, and the movie would have stood on its own two feet a lot better. So, <laughs> way to, yeah, just throw a monkey wrench in the works at the very last moment. But, I mean, there were things about this movie I, I quite liked. Um, the power of the sequence early on where... Q kind of gets plucked from obscurity in this whirlwind night with Margot. I thought that was very powerful and resonant. Uh, I've had an experience kind of like that, where you wonder how things are going to go after, and it it, it, uh, captivates your mind. So I found myself enjoying this movie overall. Uh, We're going to get to our rating here momentarily. Certainly, some things are scattershot, but we'll discuss that as we levy our ratings. Did you have any other thoughts you wanted to shout out before we get there? Well, I think you highlighted something that's interesting for me, which is that I view this movie as an adaptation. So, like, all my reactions are, how is it different from the book? How good are the cast at representing the characters that I already knew? And it's like a flaw in my thinking about the movie. Because, yeah, of course, to me, like, I don't even need to say the fact that it's the sequence is amazing where they go out on their night of pranks and like the road trip itself is so energizing and it's like a really good mirror to the the start of the book when he goes on his own sort of road trip with Margot and there's a magic about looking out on the town and calling it a, a paper town from the the skyscraper and I think another strength of the movie is I've mentioned I think John Green is a fantastic prose writer, and he's also very good at dialogue. And so the dialogue is pretty sparkling throughout. There's just lots of good quips and lots of good lines, and you can tell that someone's smart and and a good writer wrote these lines the same way that you might not get that sensation on other teen movies that we've watched. I don't know. Yeah, I guess my last thing is I wanted to just briefly, (laughs) on that point, share a couple more differences between the book and the movie. I've already talked a little bit about one important one is there's a lot more Walt Whitman's Song of Myself in there. And 
the way that the movie breaks down into three acts, the book also breaks down into three acts. The first act is called Strings, and it relates to a line that Margot said, which is that the, the strings inside him all broke, and kind of this view that Margot has that we are an interconnected world where like the only outcome is that eventually the strings between us break one at a time. And the person she says that about is the suicide victim at the start. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then the middle act is called grass. And I think I already mentioned this one is the way that everyone views grass differently and has like, there's so many different ways you can view it as a symbol in much the same way, everybody has a different view of Margot Roth Spiegelman and her disappearance. And then the so coming from an outside perspective, everyone has a different perspective on grass. Sounds really dumb to me. <laughs> <laughs> I would really need to take a closer look at this to gain an appreciation because I I don't know what the heck that means. It's sourced from Walt Whitman. So okay, well I'm not a I'm not the biggest Walt Whitman fan either, but. Uh, it receives a uh, prominent focus in Breaking Bad as well, and I, I don't really understand it there either. Uh, Interesting. But maybe I need to take a seminar. And then the, the third act is called Vessel, and that is something that's completely removed from the movie, but there's a few times in the book where Q mentions thinking of Margot as this vessel that contains all this light and all this energy and is uncrackable. And then the very last line of the book is he refers to Margot as a cracked vessel with both darkness and light. And it's kind of a thematic capper on viewing people as complex humans and appreciating that. Overall, the book is just much more literary and more about theme and scenes and specific thoughts than the movie than any movie really can be because it's all of course like a a monologue but i would say if you were charmed by the movie you would probably also be charmed by the book but maybe not sufficiently differently charmed that it would be worth going out and reading although it is a book i very much value so yeah good to know i did have a couple other things that i thought of that i wanted to mention before we wrap up here uh, Go for it. This is not exactly a reflection on the work itself, either the movie or the book. But I didn't watch this movie until this week, now that we're discussing it. But I had previously seen the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why. And I'm sure that show came after this movie and, and if anything was colored by the movie. But to me, they feel so similar. Because the gist of that one is that a popular girl killed herself before the start of the series. And she left behind this collection of tapes. And each one is addressed to a person that she knew and interacted with. And as the show unfolds, we get these chapters where each one is like a message targeted at the specific person very much like how on this night of pranks she's got this laundry list of people that she's targeting and you can view it as obviously she's going to disappear right after this she's like leaving her specific message to each person uh and what she says to q is like after tonight Live every moment of your life like you did this night. And how she says, I hope everything's going to be different tomorrow. You know, all just felt right. super suicidey to me and reminiscent of this show, 13 Reasons Why. Because also the like protagonist of the show is this gloomy, nice guy boy who was madly in love with her from the sidelines and has one of these messages that's for him. Like, all these other ones are like, you did something bad to me, and I want vengeance on you. But the message to him is along the lines of what she says to him, of like, oh, if only you'd opened up more, and, you know, seized 
your feelings. Well, so it just really colored my expectations of what this movie was going to be. Right. I think that's a really astute observation, and I hadn't made that connection, but I I do think that is a, a good connection. Some context for what inspired what. Paper Towns, the book, came out in 2008. 13 Reasons Why is actually based on a book that came out in 2007. So Paper Towns came out after 13 Reasons Why. On the other hand, I mentioned earlier that there was kind of a wave of young adult fiction colloquially called Greenlit, inspired by John Green and having very articulate protagonists in uh, kind of contemporary, non-fantasy, non-genre settings. Okay, I just now understood what Greenlit means, because it's John Green literature. Uh, yes. To me, greenlit <laughs> means that the movie gets money to go ahead and be made into a movie. Oh, man, I can see that. But yes, 13 Reasons Why was definitely a post-John Green novel in that subgenre. So it's interesting to wonder how much John Green liked the idea of tracing a disappeared person's footsteps from 13 Reasons Why when he wrote the novel. But if you kind of trace it all back down to their origins. 13 Reasons Why the Book came out before Paper Towns, the book. Interesting. Uh, the one last thing I wanted to draw attention to is my feelings on Margot. Uh, I mean, I've said a fair bit. Uh, I found the character frustrating. Uh, hard to read, but she just... Is, I, I think she should not have set up a whole National Treasure quest if she didn't want him to go on it. At least to the extent that he ended up doing it. Uh, I, I wonder, based on her reaction of, oh, I just wanted you to know I was okay. Like, did she also leave things in 13 <laughs> other people's door jams? Was she, you know, disassembling other people's closets? <laughs> that's a funny idea I hadn't considered that maybe she set it up for a lot of people Q was the only one infatuated enough to follow through on it everybody else was like her mom uh, this is more Margot nonsense <laughs> just ignore it and it'll stop it's like in Parks and Rec there's an episode where Leslie matches with Tom on a dating website but Tom has 26 different dating profiles with 26 different middle initials, and they are all crafted around different personalities. And the one that Leslie matched with was the, I think it was N for nerd, the one that he doesn't even check. Where his favorite and movie is books. Is books. <laughs> Pretty good. Speaking of judgment of characters... I wanted to just toss out as one last little thought, one little nugget here for our listeners. I'm a parent, and I dream of being a parent who will be chill enough to let my teens take spontaneous two-day road trips to New York. I feel like that's not a normal thing for a parent to just be kind of okay with. Well, you can start the trend. <laughs> All right. I am concluded in my thoughts on Paper Towns 2015. And ready to move to our our uh, concluding thoughts. What about you, Brian? I'm ready. So, Brian, is Paper Towns 2015 good? So, something I've considered lately, uh, the last few episodes, is what, what I'm going to, in quotation marks, call the pity six. And <laughs> this is a... I, I feel like I've thrown out a lot of very goods. And what does a very good mean to me? And for whatever reason, the benchmark I use for a 5 out of 8, a good on our rating system, is Some Kind of Wonderful. Which was a movie that I would say I liked it as I watched it. Nothing too bad to say about it. But I don't know if I'm going to remember it long term. That to me is a good so what makes it very good? And I feel like if I like it slightly more than that, 
I guess it's a very good. (laughs) Even if it doesn't necessarily have that power to me that I would go to someone and say, this is a very good movie. But I find myself here in a situation where I liked this movie more than some kind of wonderful. I thought it was a good movie that was also distinctive and had characters and jokes and story elements that are going to stick with me. And and so that's where I'm at. I, I don't know if pity, so-called, is fully warranted, uh, but this for me is a six. Uh, maybe not a super passionate, very good, but that's where I'm slotting it. There you go. What about you, Dan? I really thought a lot about this one. I went a lot of different ways because it's like, I don't know, how would I rate a Harry Potter movie, it's it's difficult for me to talk about because on the one hand, I rate it high because I like the story. On the other hand, I rate it medium because it's an okay adaptation in some cases that I would have liked to have been better. And that's kind of where I land on Paper Towns too. Like for me, Paper Towns, the book by John Green is like a very high seven, almost an eight, if I were reading the book. I think it's a borderline masterpiece. It really is. It's it's brimming with phenomenal writing and thematic depth, and it rewards rereading. The themes are so deftly intertwined with the story. It's just, it's a really fun read. It's funny, but it also has a lot going on with it that... I love revisiting it. And then I compare it to the movie and I like the movie and I really enjoy myself when I watch the movie. But if I think of how I feel in relationship to the book, it's like not fair to the movie. I don't know. And my only thought is that if you were to ask me how good of an adaptation is Paper Towns, I can tell you that. But how good of a movie is Paper Towns? That's kind of hard for me to answer in a vacuum. And so I'm going with how good of an adaptation is Paper Towns, the film. And for me, that is a very high, but not quite to the next level, five of good. I'm kind of surprised I'm giving this (laughs) a lower rating to you. I feel like I would be more inclined to rewatch and to recommend this. But I think if I go back and listen and, and as I edit this, Like all of my comments are about here's how the book did it differently. And in some ways that's my takeaway reaction. So, you know, we come into these ratings with our personal biases and I'm revealing one of my biases now, which is that I really enjoy watching this movie, but I also feel mixed about it. And so five is where I'm landed on that. Paper Towns is a good movie to me. It's a, it's a good adaptation but I can't, I can't in good conscience rate it any higher than that because I feel like it loses enough of what made the book so great that it just feels a little bit mixed to me. So no pity six for me. No pity six for um, Quentin either. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> that was good. I was curious after our discussion tonight... Uh, that I think I do want to track down the book, which is actually going to be pretty easy because my brother's got a copy and he's out of town now. So I'll pick that up off the bookshelf, I think, because uh, it sounds like it may develop some of the themes a little bit better than the movie did. Um, maybe it doesn't drop things as randomly. Maybe the plotting is a little more sensical. But there were just things that I liked. I, I You know, I can't give a low rating to a movie that prominently features the world's largest Black Santa collection. <laughs> That's a good call. So, for what, what appeared to be on paper a very strong Dan movie, earned some mixed remarks from Dan, and some ultimately a good rating from Brian. But, you know, the goods will surprise you some days. At least it has surprised me today. Yeah, we, we hope to surprise on occasion. So I I would say overall, the uh, archetypal Dan movie might be growing on me a little bit. (laughs) A quote I wanted to throw into our discussion somewhere, and I guess it's got nowhere to go, but here at the end, 
is um, the idea of the crowded hour. One of my favorite podcasters is Dan Carlin, who does history series. And he likes to talk about crowded hours. This was a quote that I guess Theodore Roosevelt used to describe his time in the Spanish-American War. And it's just a time where a lot of really significant events are happening in a really short period of time. That's your crowded hour. Oh, I like that. And I like crowded hour movies. I think this relates to movies that you like where it's a bunch of stuff happening like in a night. Mm -hmm. So I did a little research on this quote at one point to like better understand the meaning. And it seems like it doesn't really see a lot of use outside of it's very associated with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but apparently it tracks back to a poem that was either written or like rediscovered by Sir Walter Scott, the author of Ivanhoe. Okay. It goes, sound, sound the clarion, fill the fife, to all the sensual world proclaim. One crowded hour of glorious life is worth an age without a name. Oh, man. I just got chills. That's, like, exactly the theme. Yeah. And so it's better to live a crazy night than to spend the rest of your life in obscurity. You know, to have had that magic moment, that's what matters. One of these days I'm going to pick Can't Hardly Wait, which is... Perhaps the ultimate in the genre of the crowded hour films. And when I say ultimate, I mean the just peak over the topness of that specific topic where everything that could happen in a night happens in a night. But I'm glad that it's growing on you. So now that we've wrapped our discussion of Paper Towns 2015, the follow up to Robert 2015. <laughs> yeah. Not quite as horrifying a film, but there are some scary moments. But indeed, uh, I think you are going to, if I'm not mistaken, be kicking off our second theme month with your next selection. That's right, because the circus is coming to town. <laughs> uh, and we've talked your ears off uh, in this program already. Trust that there will be plenty of discussion about topics related to the circus what the circus means to us, what the circus has meant to the history of American popular culture, uh, all topics that lie ahead in the three rings, in the greatest show on earth that is about to come in circus month. Uh, I can be featuring movies that are about the circus, ideally, but like, if it's got some elephants in there or a prominent clown, I'm not going to be too much of a stickler. So you are welcome to interpret somewhat freely. I am going to start us off with one that very squarely fits the theme. It is The Greatest Showman from 2017. It's a musical about the life of P.T. Barnum starring two familiar faces from the goods catalog so far. In the lead role as Barnum himself is Hugh Jackman, and then playing his understudy is none other than high school musical frontman Zach Efron. Are you familiar with this one, Dan? Familiar, but have not seen it, and I'm excited to see it. I wondered if this was going to be your pick because you said last week or maybe the week before that you had more musicals up your sleeve in the near future. And so here we are. It's it's Circus Month! More Zach, more Hugh, more music as Circus Month unfolds. It's Circus Month! I'm I, psyched. Yeah, I gotta work on pumping up the enthusiasm. I love the energy that you bring in here, Dan. Circus Month! Circus Month! We're gonna bring our calliope and our piccolos and lions... So get ready. All right, I'm pumped. I will I will go watch The Greatest Showman and look forward to discussing it with you. And I'm particularly excited to see where Zach, Zach Efron has landed on his uh, 
post high school musical growth arc. But as always, thank you very much for sharing a somewhat meandering episode of The Goods with me as our protagonist meandered himself in searching for Margot Roth Spiegelman. Oh, but, right back at you, Dan. This was fun. It always is. And we appreciate you, the listener, tuning in and hope you'll do so next time. Bye.